as is the case with any kind of discussion, I think the best way to proceed here is to define our terms. And so in that spirit, um, I'm going to define uh, two concepts. Uh, one is uh, lunar narrative dissonance itself, and two is uh, I'm going to distinguish uh, the term story from what I mean when I use the term narrative. Because I, I think there's a bit of uh, confusion with regard to um, the the differences and the identities between uh, story and narrative in uh, gaming culture. So first I'm going to talk about lunar narrative dissonance. Of course, uh, the standard boilerplate definition is that lunar narrative dissonance is a situation in a video game which occurs when uh, the mode of presentation of the video game, that is, uh, the user interface, uh, the gameplay mechanics, uh, the, the structure of events in the game, uh, the um, mode of interacting with the world, or, um, say, uh, gameplay events uh, are contradict the um, uh, the narrative of the game. So that's narrative as expressed uh, primarily by or mostly by uh, either text, whether it's in text boxes or text scrolls, whatever, uh, or um, uh, verbal text, so of course speech, uh, or uh, non-verbal signs like symbols, um, images, uh, the user interface, uh, sound, for instance, um, or um, any other thing that I've left out that is used uh, to um, provide uh, context or characterization uh, that's relevant to furthering the narrative. Uh, and so that's what I mean by looted narrative dissonance. Uh, so to juxtapose uh, story and narrative, um, story is often used as a synonym for narrative in gaming culture. And I think that they are, um, they do overlap certainly, uh, but I reckon that story is um, to be considered as a subclass of narrative, rather than vice versa. Story is contained within narrative, but um, narrative is not exhausted with reference to story. There's more to narrative than that. Um, I personally reckon that the term story should actually be um, thrown out entirely, and we should use the word plot uh, to refer to... I think that's essentially what's referred to um, in most of the contexts in which I've seen the term story used. I think people are actually referring to the plot. Um, they just use story because it's, you know, it's habit. We all, that's how we all refer to, to media when we were younger. It's just stuck with us. Um, you know, I mean, I, I do it as well. But I think that in general, um, we should refer to um, the series of events, which, um, you know, there's like a three-act structure or whatever. The series of events through which a character or characters proceed as part of, um, as part of a narrative, as the plot of the narrative. Of course, the narrative outside of the plot can consist of things like uh, the uh, the mode of presentation. Um, so, for instance, in a film, uh, camera positioning and uh, the specific use, the type of camera used, um, the type of film in which it's shot, this can all contribute to the production of narrative. Um, for instance, in the film 28 Days Later, uh, the director, Danny Boyle, um, explicitly chose to shoot on a digital video rather than standard um, analog film because, um, I'm not sure if that's the term, but I'm just using analog to distinguish it from, from digital. Um, I'm not a film student yet. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Danny Boyle chose to film on digital video because he felt that the, the graininess that was often associated with digital video would provide a, a, a visual edge of realism, which would um, affect the tone of, of his film. Um, so that's a mode of presenting, uh, of um, yeah, communicating narrative through, uh, through means which aren't textual or directly textual. They are textual in the sense of being communicated by text or by um, speech, uh, which are functionally the same thing. Um, and uh, for instance, uh, I'm going to overlay a scene here from uh, Citizen Kane uh, to show another example. Um, this is, the, of course, the use of lighting um, to, um, what do you call it, to um, accentuate the narrative. So the scene that I'm displaying is um, just after, uh, it's about a like, 20 minute uh, news summary, like a public, uh, a public affairs special on the, the life and times of uh, Charles Foster Kane, the protagonist of the, um, well, very loosely, the protagonist of Citizen Kane. Um, and they appear to be journalists. So they're discussing, um, the, you, you'll notice that the lighting in the film is very sparse. We see two open windows and, uh, you know, little slits of light coming through there, and of course there's the light from the projector screen. So there's, um, there's very little lighting going on. 
And what that does is that partially obscures most of the faces in the room. You can still make out features on some of the guys. You know, some guys are sitting in better conditions. But the actual, um, the feature characters, most of the characters who are speaking have their faces obscured by darkness for most of the shot. Um, there's, there's a brilliant bit um, where um, there's a man is standing directly in front of, the, of, of a light source. And as he moves, you see the light move over his arms. And it really uh, communicates a sense of gravity, like he is the most important guy in the room. And the obscurity is a mode of presenting his anonymity. He is just a journalist to us. Even though he has a name, and he's addressed by a name, he is functionally in the film uh, a symbol. He represents uh, journalism, and this is the journalism which seizes upon Kane's legacy and decides that the most important thing about Kane, at least for the time being, is to unravel the mystery of what he said on his deathbed, Rosebud. And so this scene um, is uh, used to establish the mystery of Rosebud. And um, as a result, the lighting, the fact that it's dark, and the smoke in the room also helps to obscure things. That obscurity in the camera presentation is used to complement the obscurity of of Kane's final word. So the place is literally shrouded in mystery. Mystery being, of course, the smoke, obviously. Um, and uh, they're trying to peer out through the fog and try and uh, discern the, the kernel of meaning in, in what Kane said. So there's an example of non-textual um, narrative for you. Um, and so that's why I think it's important to distinguish between narrative and story when we're talking about um, media in general, but particularly about games. So, um, a question that might immediately follow from this is that really, what, what's the big deal about a ludonarrative dissonance? Why do we care if um, the, the gameplay and, and narrative are discordant? Why not just have fun? Why not disregard the narrative entirely? Why not just, you know, play the game? And if that's the way that you want to do it, that's cool. There are certain games um, that I play that I, I don't give a, I don't give a shit, to be honest, about the narrative. Um, uh, Diablo 3 is one of them. Um, I'm sure it's really interesting if you sit down and process it, but that's simply not what I'm playing an action RPG to do. I want to get loot, I want to engage in an interesting combat system, and I want to level up. That's what I want to do. So when I play Diablo 3, I turn my brain off. Um, perhaps that says something bad about me, but that's simply how I come to it, and I, and I would guess that I'm not alone in that. Um, and I'm sure that that applies to other games. Um, for instance, some people might not want to, um, might not care about the fact that, for instance, Tomb Raider involves some pretty serious loot and narrative dissonance. I mean, if you ignore that, the gameplay is fine. I mean, it plays like Uncharted. You know, it's it's fun. You know, you shoot the guys, you do the climbing. There's there's nothing at all wrong with that. Um, the problem arises though when we want to take games seriously as narrative. Um, when you are trying to invest yourself in a narrative, when you when you come to the to the piece specifically trying to care and trying to be invested in the to in the in the tale, ludonarrative narrative dissonance actually becomes a pretty serious problem, because it um it lowers the amount of credence we can actually give the narrative as a whole. We can't. It breaks the ability for us to get. Uh, I I hate using the term so often, but immersed in a narrative. But it also um, lo lowers our estimation of the, the cogency and of the tightness of the narrative as a whole, if uh, bits of it contradict of each other. I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of like the way that I concern about it, it uh, the way that I think about it, is that just as we dismiss arguments with, which has premises, which, with, um, sorry, which contradicts its premises, or which has premises which are contradictory, uh, we ultimately um, lessen our opinion of a story which contradicts itself in any way. Um, that might not be conceived of as, as, as a deal breaker, but as someone who loves stories, who loves narrative, uh, it's pretty important to me. Um, and I'm sure it's pretty important to many of you guys as well. So the problem is not that ludonarrative narrative dissonance breaks the game and renders it completely useless. It's that for those who care about uh, textual fidelity, uh, ludonarrative narrative dissonance is, is exactly the opposite. It's our nemesis. Um, However, um, not all dissonant um, experiences are created equal. Um, I've come up with um, a distinction between uh, ma major and mi uh, minor dissident dissonance. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm accidentally plagiarizing anyone. I don't know if I am. Um, if I am, please um, let me know in the comments, and I'll be sure to add an annotation um, explaining that that I'm that it's not in fact an original idea. Um, so anyway, uh, what I call major dissonance is that which um, 
renders the dimension of the narrative incoherent. So, for instance, with regard to Tomb Raider, um, because it's the the best example I can think of in recent memory, um, Lara, when she kills her first human being in a cutscene, she is um, she is um, represented as uh, as very much distraught. Um, she's struggling to come to terms with what she's done. Uh, she's she's breathing really heavily. It appears to be a really existential confrontation with her. Not only um, with it's with mortality of the other. It's with the fact that she is capable of ending a life, and that she now has to grapple with these really weighty moral choices on a pretty frequent basis. That is kind of harrowing, especially if you're coming at, to it for the first time. So that's presented okay in the cutscene. I mean, it's not great. But, you know, it's, it's done alright. But then, um, immediately after the cutscene ends, I mean, you take your pistol, and then you just shoot a bunch more guys. Um, and it would be fine if, for instance, you know, her movement was shaky, and, like, the aim were, you know, erratic, like it was impossible to... Like, if they represented through the gameplay mechanics her difficulty with it, because, of course, of course she needs to kill them. Uh, my problem is not that she kills, because, I mean, it's either she kills them or they kill her. So, and this is the, this is true for all of the combat throughout the game. Lara's never predatory. Um, she kills because if she were to leave these people alive, they would kill her or her friends. So, it's all done out of self-defense. But, um, I wish they really needed to have been communicated through the gameplay, through the mechanics, um, Lara's... Uh, reluctance to engage in this sort of thing, and uh, Lara's anger, Lara's despair at herself, uh, Lara's desperation. Uh, this should all have been communicated, as I said, through, you know, erratic aiming, or if she if she vomited every now and again, for instance, or she had to stop to catch her breath, if every now and again when you tried to shoot her, she would she would uh, not shoot, and she would, like, try and cower and, uh, and um, resist it. Uh, and um, this is not because she's a woman, um, just to clarify people um, who might accuse me of misogyny here, uh, I'm merely um, speaking of um, the reaction to coming to terms with with the capacity to end life. And I, 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 would, I would propose that this be the same for, for um, all genders. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's major dissonance, that's an example. And minor dissonance is that which is uh, somewhat discordant or, or jarring, like, to perceive but which doesn't necessarily compromise the general cogency of the narrative. So an example of that is the one which um, uh, the Jim Sterling pointed out in his uh, video on uh, Ludo Narrative Dissonance. It's very good. It's called uh, Ludo Scababib Disco Biscuits. I highly recommend you watch it. Um, in Bioshock Infinite, for instance, um, which is uh, that uh, Booker DeWitt, a man very much on borrowed time, or at least who's running out of time, who... Um, in the gameplay, it's not represented as time sensitive, but narratively, I mean, he's got to he's got to go in there and get the girl, and there's, he's got no time to to lollygag around. Um, but what does Booker do? He runs around Columbia, foraging through uh, you know waste waste bins and eating stuff that he finds in there, stealing people's food off off of tables directly in front of them and shoving them immediately in his mouth, eating an inhuman amount of food and drink. Um, for, for no reason, without social context, without communicating to anyone. This kind of stuff is an instance of minor dissonance. If you think about it with respect to the narrative, it's fucking bizarre. Like, <laughs> if you saw a man come up to you and eat your food, you would have a stronger reaction than the citizens of Columbia do. Um, but, because it's a video game, of course, um, there needs to be a way of incorporating a healing mechanic, and so eating food and drink is a, is a natural, pretty... Uh, pretty acceptable mode of incorporating a healing mechanic. It's just that when you combine a food healing mechanic with a, 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 an attempted simulation or a representation of a simulation of a society, um, and when you place them directly in front of each other, it's not so much dissonant when, you know, when all of the citizens are scattered about and, you know, it's really co like combat heavy when it's just you and enemies. Because, of course, look at Booker would, you know, grabs some food that he sees and eats it, and eats it to restore his health. That that makes a bit more sense. But it, the dissonance is much more discordant and much more jarring when it's when it when it, it's the quieter periods in Colombia and he's walking around, you know, normal people and just eating in front of them. That kind of stuff. That's a that's an instance of minor dissonance. It doesn't break the game, but um, it does uh, render the experience a bit 
jarring if you if you look at it um, with respect to the narrative. And last but not least in this little segment, I wanted to talk briefly, respond briefly to an article that uh, Brett Makedonsky wrote uh, for Destructoid on, in September of 2012 called uh, Ludo Narrative Dissonance, The Roadblock to Realism. And I'll, I'll include a link to that article in the, uh, in the description. You should go read it. It's pretty good for the most part. But um, I am going to respond to the bit where he uh, accuses uh, Max Payne 3 of, of Ludo Narrative Dissonance. Um... I won't read the whole thing, but he says that, um, you know, it says, uh, I'll do a, a bit of a direct quote. Um, as he suffers from nearly, cat- um, this is a quote, as he suffers from nearly catatonic levels of depression, almost every cutscene depicts Max in drowning in a filth of whiskey and popping painkillers like they were Skittles. Bloodness permeates these scenes as Max haphazardly and unnecessarily points out what a train wreck he is. Then the action begins, and Max operates like a well-oiled killing machine. For a character that is illustrated as a barely functioning addict drowning in a sea of self-loathing, Max has no real problems diving and shoe-dodging all over the place. Uh, Rockstar painted the picture of a character that would be luck- prone to blacking out, having debilitating headaches, and are generally stumbling about like a buffoon. Um, so, here's, here's my response. Um, as I've pointed out in, in my videos prior, the, the shoe-dodge mechanic, the diving and the shooting, um, are actually uh, representations of Max's suicidality, rather than um, existing as a, a, a refutation in gameplay of his suicidality. It's, it is literally the most dangerous thing that you could do in his situation. He's constantly tempting suicide by cop. That is consistent with his depression and desperation. Um, and um, one can easily say that as, as the consequence of, of, of uh, substance abuse, for instance. It does make one desperate. Um, and what do you call it? Yes, uh, about with regard to the the blacking out and stuff, um, it's not really implied that you know he drinks that much. To be honest, um, the problem with alcoholism isn't so much the amount of alcohol that you consume, but it's the dependency, uh, and it's it's the fact that you that you need alcohol to cope with um, with life, or that eventually the alcohol overtakes life and becomes life. And in the in the game, we actually see this. I mean, we see scenes of Max drinking uh, when he fails. So, for instance, he has that scene where he, he drinks and breaks the glass after he fails um, to uh, protect Fabiana uh, at the nightclub. And um, he gets drunk and passes out on the couch um, after he, uh, what do you call it, he once again um, fails to get her back uh, from the uh, from Serrano and the guys down at the docks, so Max's love is not for the drink itself, but rather for the drink's capacity to to numb his senses, and rather to numb the sense of his own failure, to try and and make himself more tolerable to himself, easier to live with. Um, we find this, for instance, in the bar scene where he's drinking. At, and just before Passos walks in, he's very explicit about this. He says. Um, that that his life has become more about trying to fill the holes of the things that have been left, or the things that have left him. Um, so his yeah, as I say, his drinking is not compulsive due to the properties of the alcohol, but rather because of the massive amounts of grief he's trying to deal with. And uh, as regarding the the headaches and stuff, uh, that's actually represented in the game. That's what that's what the the blurriness and the shaking of the camera is uh, during the game. The bright flashes of light. Um, they represent pain. I mean, when um, certain areas of the brain are, st- are stimulated by, um, you know, under uh, um, uh, what do you call it? electrostimulation, um, uh, th- certain people often report seeing, you know, colours or feeling things, you know, feeling pleasure or pain or whatever. So that's kind of a mode of representing to us his pain. I mean, he he really does have a headache, and that's the only way that he, we could represent it, apart from you know, adding a little rumble function or without him saying, I have a headache all the time. Um, so it's actually a really clever way of imparting um, the idea that Max has a headache, uh, rather than um, than being a, a dissonant way and failing to address it. And finally, about the general shooting itself and the way that Max controls. You know, the fact that, for instance, you don't have the drunk physics from GTA 4 operating all the time. I mean, firstly, before he's... it's for most of the, In most of the cases, he's not drunk just before the missions. I mean, in the case of the New Jersey bar, he does. Uh, so perhaps that's a little bit dissonant. Perhaps he should be uh, a little stumbly or whatever. But um, 
once again, we haven't seen him drunk that much. Perhaps he hasn't had that much to drink. After all, it is only a little bit after nine. Um, so it's not as if this whole the, the encounter is taking place at two in the morning or whatever, um, when an alcoholic will have really, truly gotten into their stride. I mean, it's pretty early in the evening, all told. The reason that he's still okay for the shooting and stuff, despite, you know, being addicted to alcohol and painkillers and things like that, despite having substance dependencies, which would debilitate most people, is that, from doing such things, is because that, I mean, Max has always had a natural, kind of, almost preternatural talent for killing. Um, and he implicitly touches on that in a specific line of dialogue from, I believe, the uh, the level uh, Suntan Stale Margaritas and Greed, um, when he says that, um, for instance, it was easier to just shoot anything that moved in front of him than to actually um, to think about um, the, the possibility that Passos might be selling him out of it, or um, might be acting as a kind of double agent working for Marcelo to help launder money. Um, so, um, that kind of, that, the implicit conclusion to be drawn from this is that, um, or rather what's implicitly buried in that text, is that um, Max deals with violence, uh, or uses violence to deal with his problems, because it's pretty much what he knows how to do. It's what Max is best at, it's what he feels most comfortable with. He falls back on violence as a solution, and so that would imply that he has a certain level of skill um, that would not be impacted pretty severely by the stuff that he consumes. I mean, the, in fact, pretty much the only thing about him that remains solid is his ability to kill. Everything else is... Um, what do you call it, is uh, falling at by the wayside. And why Brett, well, Brett might see that as an example of, say, of, um, of dissidence, a dissonance in the, um, in the gameplay. I would rather interpret it as um, a further mode of characterization for Max, in that he is, the shooting is all he's good for, because really, I mean, the fact that in the gameplay shooting is all he's good for is a representation of him narratively. Shooting is all he's good for. And that's exactly why he was picked as uh, the patsy to take the fall by uh, Victor Branco. Um, and um, what do you call it? Um, whatever his first name is, uh, De Silva, the, uh, the cop who eventually um, feeds Max the clues he needs to understand the conspiracy and pushes him in the right direction at the end. Uh, this is why De Silva um, refers to him as, you know, the idiot, as the, you know, the dumb gringo. And Max comes to accept it because he was played. And he was able to be played because his psyche was so broken down by the ordeals he's gone through, and because he falls back on violence as a way to um, to he shoots his way out of his problems. Um, and and so for me that isn't dissonant; it's in fact uh, convergent.